So the title of my message this morning is I am not the Christ. And I think probably you already know who I'm going to speak about. And uh, I'm I'm going to talk about someone who preceded Jesus. Someone who set the table for Jesus' ministry. Someone who preached the good news that did not sound so good. Do you remember Jesus' first message? He preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And this man preached the same message. The Bible tells us that this man named John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, a voice of wine crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. John's ministry is mentioned in all the four gospels, and it was predicted long before he was even born. We all know that he was the miraculous son of Zechariah, an old priest, and his wife, Elizabeth. They were unable to have children. And according to the Gospel of Luke, the birth of John was foretold by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah while he was performing his functions as a priest in the Temple of Jerusalem. John's forerunning was integral to what Jesus had come to do. John got the people thinking about their lives, about their relationship with God. John the Baptist was the preparer of the way for Jesus. Let's go further. Verses 4 and 6. It says, John himself had a camel head garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, all the vicinity of Jordan were flocking to him. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Doesn't this seem a little odd? Why would people come from all over to see this man? To someone who had no power, no authority, no position in the Jewish political system. But yet people were thronging to him to hear him speak. He spoke with irresistible authority. The reason is because he was respected. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, Jesus' cousin, and Jesus once said about him, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus also referred to him as a prophet, and that's quite significant, a compliment, because a prophet was someone who boldly spoke for God, one who wasn't afraid to say what God was really thinking. Prophets were politically incorrect, often issuing warnings of impending judgment. Isaiah and Malachi both spoke of his coming. For 400 years, there had been silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then John came to prepare the way for the Lord. Malachi ends with these powerful words closing the book of Malachi and the Old Testament with the hope of what was still to come. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. When John showed up, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. And then out of the blue comes this man into the desert near the Dead Sea, wearing a rough, dark camel hair coat with a leather belt, offering this one provocative message, repent of your sins and turn to God. A message of challenge and hope together. John got the people's attention because he lived a very simple life. Like we saw, he wore a camel's coat, camel hair coat, 
and ate locusts and wild honey. He lived in the desert, a very tough life, but it really made sense for John to call the desert his home because of what the prophet Isaiah had prophesied about him, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. John's appearance and lifestyle spoke volumes about him. I'm not sold out to the culture. No one owns me. I can tell you the truth straight up. Then you have nothing. You have nothing to lose. John also got the people's attention because he dressed exactly like the ancient prophet Elijah. Every Jew knew that before the Messiah came, a prophet like Elijah would show up who dressed like him and talked like him. This was so that the people would know that God is up to something and they would be ready for it. Once John got their attention, what did he preach? Two things he preached. The first is repent. He told the people that if you wanted to live a life that is God, the first thing you should do is repent. We all know that God loves us and that is true. But we also need to hear that God expects us to follow him with a life that is pleasing to him. And if we are heading the wrong way, we need to turn around. Repent is really the message we want to hear. But if you're heading in the wrong direction, isn't that exactly the message you want to hear? Right? Sometime back, we were just visiting some friends and uh, I was driving. And uh, I don't like driving on unknown roads. Okay? And uh, I'm driving and I miss this exit. And I'm like, oh no, where am I going? Where am I heading? I said, I missed the exit. Now I have to, I don't know where the road is going and I have to go right ahead and just turn around. But just before, you know, I could even finish my thought, there was a turning. Thank God for Jesus. There is a turning. You and I can turn. God is looking for lives that are sold out to him. But the question is this. We must ask and answer this question. Is my life pleasing to God? And the kind of life that pleases God starts with repentance. The first thing John told the people is repent. Not only repent, confess your sins and be baptized. Imagine going out into the Jordan River and baptism was a public act. People were all around listening to you, confessing your sin. But you know, John was trying to make a point. He was saying that following God is not for show, but following God is honest, it's radical. The second part that John spoke about when he preached was live a life that is real. We start by repenting and then we continue to live a life that is real. We do not act like we're better than we are. Just need to be open, honest and real with God. He already knows us. He knows our lives. I would really like people to think that I am great, that my life is absolutely in order. But that's not a great place to be in. And he says, produce fruit that is consistent of repentance. And what is he trying to say? What kind of fruit is he talking about? And I'm not going into the scripture, but if you want to write down, you can write it this in Luke 3, 10 to 14. After the people... Uh, are baptized by John and they repent, they turn around, they ask him this one question, what do we do now? And he tells the people, the one has two shirts, you must share with someone who doesn't. The one who doesn't have food, share. Share the food that you have. 
He spoke to the tax collectors. Don't collect any more than you have been authorized. He spoke to the soldiers. Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. So what is John saying? Repent, be real, and let everyone see the fruit of your repentance. In short, treat people right. Be honest, be generous. Look for the opportunities to serve. Love God with more than your words. Love him with your life. Just let's look, look at and learn from a few truths of John's character. Okay, three truths I'm going to share with you this morning. And the first one is he was not positional, but he was passionate. He was not positional, but he was passionate. If you can turn with me to your Bibles, to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That light was a true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. The author has already told us in verse 7, that John the Baptist was a witness. And now he makes it even more clearer in verse 8. He says he was not the light, but he came as a witness to that light. Again in verse 19 and 20, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, these are the words of John himself. This is not the author writing about John. This is John himself speaking to the people. And they go and ask him, who are you? Who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. Verse 21. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, no, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Come on, John. You are somebody. Why would you be baptizing people if you are a nobody? Why would you be preaching a message of repentance if you are a nobody? Aren't you Elijah? The one the prophet Malachi had prophesied about? Luke tells us that when the, Gabriel, uh, when the angel Gabriel visited Zechariah, he told him that John would be like Elijah. He would come in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And he could have very well said, yes, I am Elijah. At least I'm a prophet. I'm the one who Malachi prophesied about, but he chose to keep the spotlight of him. And there's more. Verse 26 and 27, John answered them saying, I'm baptized with water, but there stands one among you whom do you, you do not know. It is he who is coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. Again, John, in chapter 3 says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. Beloved, he must increase and I must decrease. Can you say this with me? He must increase and I must decrease. Let's look at the great knots N-O-T-S of John's witness. I am not the light. I am not the Christ. I am not Elijah. 
I am not the prophet. I am not worthy to untie his sandals. I am not the bridegroom. I am none of these. My joy is complete when the bride looks to the bridegroom. I will rejoice when all the attention is shifted from me to Jesus. Can we say this? I will rejoice when all the attention turns to Christ away from us. Just like the psalmist said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name be all the glory for your unfailing love and fruitfulness. Friends, he must increase and we must decrease. This should be the essence of our witness. We must make much of him and not much of ourselves. Even if we are tempted to take all the spotlight, all the glory for ourselves. I'm sure John went through this temptation, right? I'm sure he went through it to be recognized, to be known as the Christ, or at least Elijah and the prophet, because those were the, the, the prophecies that were spoken about him. But he even rejected those prophecies that were spoken about him. He had a fan following. He was popular. He had hundreds of people coming from all over the place to see him. If he were living in our time, he would probably be trending on all the social media platforms. Everyone would be speaking about this man, John the Baptist. But you know what? He discarded all those titles. They were nothing compared to preparing the way for Jesus. They were nothing compared to the mission that he was given. He was so clear and passionate about his mission that when they asked him, sir, who are you? Tell us, we need to go back and tell the ones who have sent us, we need to report to them, who are you? And he is so clear about his mission and he says, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. I am not the Christ. I am only the precursor. I'm only pointing you in this direction. Beloved, know this, that God has a specific mission for your life. Don't try to fit into somebody else's shoes. They won't fit you. Who learn? How do we present ourselves while we are presenting Jesus? Did you know that several New Testament accounts report oh, wow. that some of Jesus' early followers had previously been John's followers? They left John and they followed Jesus. Can you imagine what John must have gone through? I can imagine. Yet in his mouth were only Christ exalting words and not self exalting words. He was not positioned, but he was passionate about the call over his life. Are you passionate? about the call over your life? Are you clear about the mission that God has entrusted to you? The second is he was the witness. Like we read in John 1, 6 to 8, it spoke about John, John the writer, John the apostle is writing about John the Baptist. Too many Johns. So he came to bear witness of the light so that through him people may believe. Firstly, the author tells us that John the Baptist was a man, just like you and me, who was sent by God. You are sent by God also. Right until verse 5, the writer is talking about Jesus, him being the word, him being the light, him being the life. And it looks like the word, the light, and the life will spread sovereignly on its own. It can happen that way. God can do anything sovereignly. But the writer knows that this is not the case. 
this word, this life, this light are going to spread through the witness of human beings and no other way. This word, light and life are coming into the world, but they are not going to conquer the world by just sending some flash of lightning. They will ignite cold, sinful hearts like ours and conquer. The gospel will come through human witnesses. The gospel will come through you and me. This was the plan right from the beginning. Now, this does not mean that God is dependent on man. He was involved in sending Jesus, and he is involved in sending us as witnesses for Jesus. God makes human witnesses necessary, but he does not leave the mission to our initiative. He doesn't leave it to the initiative of man. He is the one who sends. And that is why Jesus tells us to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the mission field, into the harvest. Friends, we serve a God who saves and sends. He provides the foundation of our salvation in Jesus, and he also provides the means of our salvation in those whom he sends. God is at work right now today, all over the world, moving his witnesses through the world, making them the means of the saving work. And I hope this can make us say, just like the prophet Isaiah said, Lord, here I am, send me. Lord, here I am, send me. Let's look at verse 7 again. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Now, this is John's main identity in this gospel. He came as a witness. He's introduced here as a witness, a mere human sent by God, and his mission was to be a witness to the light. Believing the light happens through a witness to the light. There is no other way. So our, our witness is necessary. Without a witness, no one believes. John came as a witness so that all through him might believe. You and I are called to be witnesses so that all through us may believe. The third point, he was fearless. The first was he was not positional, but he was passionate. The second was he was the witness. And the third is he was fearless. The words of truth that moved many to repentance goaded others to resistance and resentment. In those days, mostly the only person who got baptized was an occasional Gentile who wanted to convert and become a Jew. John told the religious insiders, you know what? Your Jewishness is not going to save you. You need to confess and be baptized. John's reputation grew, and soon some of the most respective religious people in the country started coming. And it was not easy going all the way into the desert to listen to this man. And then you hear him say this, Matthew 3, 7 and 9, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Imagine you're traveling all those miles just to hear him preach. And this is what you hear. Brood of vipers who want you to flee from the coming wrath. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance and don't presume to say to yourselves that you have Abraham as your father. Don't throw names. Don't throw names. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. John was not afraid of the religious or political leaders of his day. 
He saw beyond their exterior. He saw deep into their hearts. He spoke the he spoke the truth with clarity and with passion. He didn't live to please people, but to simply preach the need for forgiveness of sin. He called out the Pharisees and Sadducees for what they truly were. And he knew that their hearts and their lives were far away from God. Prophets weren't subtle at all. Don't you think so? Brood of vipers is not exactly eloquent and respectful. It must have been shocking for the religious leaders to hear John speak like this, to criticize him. The crowds must have been shocked. The ordinary people looked up to these leaders. But you know what? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had one weakness, and that was they wanted public approval. They had a weakness for public spirituality. Then Jesus also at many occasions rebuked them. Whitewashed tombs. You like to pray long prayers, repetitive prayers. You like to know everybody. Tell everybody that you're fasting. You want everyone to know how much you're giving. They enjoyed being known for their good lives. Their motto was, it's better to look good than to be good. And that's an easy lifestyle that we can also fall into. Because we want people to think that we are good. Beware of that form of godliness. Not only did he speak to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but he even confronted Herod one of the four rulers from Palestine. When Herod had taken Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, to become his own, John confronted him and told him the truth very clearly and very plainly. It is not lawful for you to have her. And this bothered Herod so much that he had John in prison. He wanted to kill him, but he was afraid of the crowd that the people considered him to be a prophet. But on his birthday celebration, in response to a promise he had given to the daughter of Herodias, John's life tragically ended. But although they were able to kill him, they were unable to stop his message because the one who John had announced was already on the move. John's mission was accomplished. He had prepared the way for the Savior. He was done. He had fulfilled his call over his life, and he was ready to go home. Now, there probably were times in his imprisonment that even John, this fearless man, could have doubted God. And we see that in the gospel. And he had his own fears. He wondered if Jesus was really the Messiah, the one who had come to set them free. And if so, why was he in prison? And why was Jesus not setting him free? This life event, the coming of the Messiah, was all that John had lived for. And now he was wondering, was I wrong in recognizing Jesus as the Messiah? Beloved, even the most fearless men and women go through their own set of fears and doubts. But Jesus is there to assure them, just like he told John's disciples. John sent out his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? And Jesus did not reply with a sermon on faith and patience. He continued to do what he was doing that is healing the sick, delivering people. And then he turns up around to the disciples and he tells them, go and report this to John. What you have seen, what you have heard, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Go and tell John that you were not wrong in simple words. 
So today, if you're battling with fear and doubts, let me tell you, Jesus is here to give hope and faith. He is here. We need to be fearless. We need to be witnesses. We need to preach the gospel without any fear. In conclusion, here's the lesson for us today. We must be his witness. It is a great necessity. Faith comes by hearing a witness. But we must not make much of ourselves. Beware of the witness that needs attention for himself. Beware of someone, let's include ourselves also in this, who constantly angles to put himself in good light and returns again and again to his ministry and his achievements. Beware of your own bent to the love, to love the praise of men. Beware of this form of godliness. And I want to leave you with a few questions this morning. Are you position-minded or are you passionate? Are you faithful to the call of God over your life for his glory? Or are you seeking to be recognized by man? Are you a witness for Christ? Can you be that small flame so that people would believe in the light? Are you fearless? Are you sharing the love of God without any fears or doubts? Are you saying he must increase and I must decrease? It is all about him. And I want to pray for you right now, but before I do that, I want us to just respond to the message. Is there anything in this message that has provoked you or touched you? Why don't you just come to the Lord this morning? Let's come to him. And let's ask him to give us grace. Just to be who he has called us to be. Not to be who we are not. Or who he has not called us to be. Be satisfied with your calling, beloved. And not only be satisfied with your calling, but be passionate about it. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. Love him. Please him. And make this the motto of your life. He must increase and we must decrease. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence here, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you just come and invade our hearts. Lord, purge out all that is not of you, God. But even as your word has come this morning, Father, may we be those witnesses, O oh God, to your son, Jesus. Send us out, Lord. Send us like you sent John. Send us as torchbearers, the ones that reflect your light. And Lord, in doing so, Lord, we pray that we would not be consumed with ourselves. We would not be consumed with popularity, with being famous, but that we would be consumed with the passion for your name, O oh God. Lord, so we thank you for each and every one right here, Lord, attending. We pray for every family, Lord. We bless them. We ask you, Lord, that this entire week, O oh God, may we meditate on what we have heard, O oh God. And may we live out those lives, O oh God, that are pleasing unto you, Jesus. Protect us, provide for us, O oh Lord, for this entire week. Bless each and every household, O oh God. 
We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.